uh, welcome back and, and good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome into the second half of the breakout session on water that's worth its salt. Uh, and highlighting the sp highlights and specifics of brackish groundwater and, and a lot of the efforts going on in and around the state from a GCD perspective, some ind individual case studies, um, as well as uh, a general overview uh, from the Water Development Board and their efforts continuing and ongoing. Uh, we'll discuss GCD perspectives and rulemaking uh, as well, uh, tied into House Bill 722 that we've heard referenced several times today. Um, remember to type your questions in the question tab on your GoToWebinar uh, control panel, and we'll address them at the end of each speaker's presentation. Uh, first up is Ms. Erica Mancha, the manager of Innovative Water Technologies with the Texas Water Development Board, discussing updates and the brackish groundwater production zones. I think you're still on mute, ma'am. Yeah, great. Thank you. Glad I'm uh, not well the only one. <laughs> Uh, well, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, today, I'll provide you with an update on TWDB designated brackish groundwater production zones, including some background and future steps. But before we get started, I'd like to tell you more about the Innovator Water Technologies Department. Um, our department was created in 2005 to advance the alternative of water supplies. The diagram shows the four program areas our team covers, which includes aquifer storage and recovery, brackish resource aquifer characterization system, which is known as the BRACS, water reuse, and desalination. The program we'll focus here on today is the BRACS program, which was funded in 2009 with the main objective to map and characterize brackish aquifers in the state. It is estimated that Texas has 2.7 billion acres feet of brackish groundwater. And these brackish aquifers are shown yellow in the map. Now, in the BRACS program, we define brackish groundwater as groundwater with a total dissolved solids concentration from 1,000 to 10,000 milligrams per liter, um, existing operating desalination plants in Texas, desaline eight brackish groundwater with a TDS concentration from one to 4,000 milligrams per liter. The BRAC programs uses this five tier system classification system shown on the slide for the aquifer studies. Depending on the data availability, they will characterize groundwater from fresh to brine and brine has the salinity concentration of seawater. Now, prior to House Bill, prior to 2015, the BRACS program was mapping brackish aquifers that had future desalination projects as indicated by the state water plan or by request. Then in summer of 2015, House Bill 30 passed by the 84th Texas legislature that directed the Texas Water Development Board to identify and designate zones in the state in four specific aquifers and the remaining aquifers in the state by specific deadline. For each designated zone, we had to determine groundwater volumes that the zone can produce over 30 and 50 year periods without causing impacts, make recommendations on reasonable monitoring, work with GCDs and stakeholders, and provide an update in the biennial desalination report. Now, what is the brackish groundwater production zone? And these are areas with moderate to high availability and productivity that are separated by hydrological barriers sufficient to prevent significant impacts to water availability or water quality in geological strata that has fresh groundwater. Now, how does the TWD designate zones? Well, there's an informal work process that can be summarized in three steps. First, we characterize the whole aquifer or portion of an aquifer. Second, we apply House Bill 30 criteria, and then we identify and evaluate areas for zone designation. And lastly, BRAC staff recommends potential areas to the executive administrator, and the board considers recommendations and designates zones at a board meeting. 
At each step of the process, the work is documented and deliverables, including well data, GIS files, and reports are all made publicly available and not downloadable from our TWDB website. The first step is to really kind of conduct a BRAC study that entails collecting and entering data, picking tops and bottoms of an aquifer, determining the amount of sand in the aquifer, collecting and reviewing water quality data, data calculating salinity from geophysical well logs and calculating groundwater volumes, as well as summarizing the findings in a report along with the GIS files and well data. Now, this is an important scientific work and step that needs to be conducted before uh, designating the actual zones. In the second step, BRAC staff apply House Bill 30 criteria and evaluate areas for zone designation. As an example, here on the figure on the right shows the Nakatosh Aquifer Study Area and the areas excluded from being recommended as zones. So first, um, we buffer existing use, um, well use, and this are uh, sources of water supply for municipal, domestic, or agriculture purposes. And typically we buffer that with a three mile buffer or more, and they are shown as um, shown on the map with deep turquoise color in the figure. Uh, we also buffer the fresh water line with a three mile buffer as shown in sand color on the map. We also buffer class two injection wells with a 50 mile buffer um, shown as purple circles on the map. And please note that we do buffer all injection wells or disposal wells permitted under Texas Water Code Chapter 27 if they exist and within the existing area. We also buffer the state lines with a three mile buffer shown in pink on the map. And finally, we would ensure that there is a hydrological barrier of 100 feet. The third step would be to um, back staff to recommend potential areas to the executive administrator. And then the board would consider recommendations and designate zones at a board meeting. Preparing for the board meeting is a three month process. And the figure on the right shows the five TWD designated zones in the Nakajosh Aquifer study area. Now, in total, the TWD has designated 31 brackish groundwater production zones and eight aquifers. Eight zones in, Oct in October 2016 and 23 zones in March 2019. The hatch areas on the map are excluded areas from designation per House Bill 30. Now here in Carrizo, in, in, as I mentioned in October, 2016, in the, there was um, in the Carrizo Wilcox aquifer, there was one zone designated. Um, in the Gulf Coast aquifer, there was four. Then we had three zones in the Rustler and three zones, um, three zone. And then in March, 2019, I apologize. We had three zones, three zones in the Blossom aquifer and the Blossom Aquifer in that similar area. And then um, no zone, um, I apologize, no zones in the Lipan Aquifer, five zones in the Nakatosh Aquifer. And then um, we also had um, about 15 zones in the Northern Trini Aquifer. And as you see this kind of area up Northeast, it gets a little crowded with all the zones because they're overlapping in that area. Now these recent designations that we made in March 2019, we'll be including those updates in the 2020 desalination biannual report. In total, there are 20 GCDs that have a zone or a portion of a zone in their area. As shown, and here are some details as shown in the map. So this map shows the completed and current aquifer studies in the BRAX program. The lab the left side shows completed studies. There are two studies completed prior to 2015 that we'll need to evaluate for zones. These include the Peckles Valley Aquifer and the Gulf Coast Aquifer in the lower Rio Grande Valley. But we don't expect to designate zones in this area because of extensive use of brackish groundwater. Now the right map shows current studies in the upper coastal plain central aquifer study shown in, in the salmon color is completed, but the report is writing for publication. 
The Hill Country Trinity Aquifer is shown in blue and it's expected to be completed by the end of the year. The Queen City Sparta Aquifer South, the contractor is currently finishing the study and that's shown in, in cyan color. And then the BRAC staff just kind of restarted the Edwards Trinity Plateau and kicked, shown in purple and then kicked off the East Sparta Aquifer as well. Now for future studies, we have identified seven aquifers that meet House Bill 30 criteria. And these are shown on the right, on the left, on the left map. And we'll need to map and evaluate the, evaluate those for zones by December 1st, 2032. Uh, the remaining 12 aquifers on, shown on the map to the right, we will actually evaluate those zones after meeting the legislative deadline. As mentioned earlier, zones can be designated, cannot be designated in an area of geological stratum that is designated or used for wastewater injection through the use of injected wells or disposal wells that are permitted under the Texas Water Code Chapter 27. And in the past aquifer designations, we have applied 15 mile buffer to these class two injection wells. And can stakeholders consider this very conservative? So what we have done is we're funding a study to create procedures and tools to kind of help determine the appropriate buffer for each class two injection well, or at a minimum at a default buffer per aquifer. We will also form a advisory technical work group that will be consisting of federal and state agencies to build scientific consensus on appropriate buffer sizes um, the contract is expected to start um, this month and deliverables are expected by August of next year. Now, before TWD designated brackish groundwater production zones, um, we did not have any other um, kind of regulatory requirements associated to them. But in 2009, the 86 Texas legislature passed House Bill 722, which created a framework for DCDs to establish permitting rules for a person interested in producing brackish groundwater production zones um, and producing water uh, from the zone for either a municipal drinking water or electrical generation project. Uh, the legislative directive did not apply to the DACOM aquifer or to the High Plains Underground Water Conservation District. Um, the House Bill 722 kind of had, there was kind of three parties involved. You had the Texas Water Development Board, the Permittee and Groundwater Conservation Districts. For the board, it directed us to conduct technical reviews of operating permit applications submitted to the GCDs and when requested by a GCD, we were also required to investigate the impacts of brackish groundwater production through their annual reports. Um, TWD would have 120 days to conduct an annual report review, and there was no time frame associated for permit reviews. Now, there are some requirements for the permit T. There would have to provide some you know, data required for the application and also provide annual reports after production um, begins. The GCD also had to adopt rules within 180 days after an interested party petitioned to complete and permit wells uh, that they wanted to withdraw from one of the designated zones. Now to implement the directive, the board approved the publication of proposed, like some, some proposed procedure rules under chapter 356 at our board meeting in August 5th, 2020. We are proposing to define two new terms. Um, this would include brackish groundwater production zone and also brackish groundwater production zone operating permit. Uh, we would also clarify how the agency identifies and designates zones. We would outline how the agency would conduct a technical review of operating permit applications as well as annual reports. And we would also specify what our reports would contain that would go back to the GCD. These rules have been um, posted in the Texas Register on August 21st. 
And the 30-day comment period in September 21st at 5 p.m. Uh, we, you know, we encourage stakeholder participation and it is important for us. Um, so if anyone would like to submit a comment, you're able to submit it by mail, email, or fax as indicated here on the slide. And um, you just need to put chapter 3056 in the subject line. Um, but once we do receive uh, comments and uh, we will go ahead and actually review them, address them, and in the future, we'll request an abort meeting approval of adoption of the rules with any revisions that we've included based on the comments that were submitted. Now, lastly, um, we have um, received several questions um, related to kind of zone designations in general, and just wanted to kind of share some of those questions and responses uh, for GCDs to kind of consider in their implementation process. Um, so I'll kind of just kind of go down the line here. And, you know, one of the questions was when multiple GCDs span um, a zone, will one or all GCDs receive the report? Um, and this would include either the report for permit review or for the annual per, uh, report investigation. And what TWD would do, and we try to we clarify this in the rules, is that we would submit it to the GCD that either submits the permit application for review or that um, request for us to do a nine review report. Um, now, question number two, when multiple GCDs span over a zone, how are production volumes allocated among GCDs? Well, um, statute and rule language don't, re don't really indicate that. For us, it directs the TWTB uh, to designate zones and to designate it as a whole, like to actually allocate volumes as a whole for a zone, um, but it doesn't um, tell us or direct us to separate it by DCDs. That will be up, you know, left up to the GCD to decide. Is there a formal process for a zone designation? And as I discussed earlier, there isn't a formal process, but we do have an like an informal process internally that we kind of go by. Question number four, is there a formal process to amend a zone designation? And no, we don't have a formal process, but we have started um, thinking about a process and what would that entail and just kind of having some internal discussions on that. Some other questions include, can a GCD reanalyze production volumes and pumping rates for a designated zone? And um, the GCD can, but if they are going to request the TWDD to kind of um, consider those, vol you know, those that new analysis that they, um, they just conducted, we would have to um, you know, re receive all the files and kind of review all the information um, to be able to consider um, changing the production volumes or the pumping rates for, for any of those anesthetic zones. Question number six, do modeled available groundwater overlap, um, also known as max overlap designated zones? And the answer is yes, they do. 23 of 31 zones overlap in MAG. Um, and so that's something GCDs need to consider when they do adopt their rules. They'll need to consider the MAGs and the DC, DFCs. Um, for a permit in an overlap area between a MAG and a zone, how will it be permitted? And so currently the volume in the overlap area would be considered as part of the MAG and not new water from a TWD designated zone, um, but permit requirements related to that are really up to the GCD. Some other questions here, you know, how to address the lack of existing well control in certain areas of designated zones. Well, we have um, put together kind of a list of data recommended for GCDs to ask permittees. Uh, we've already kind of shared that with some stakeholders. And so we'd be willing to share that with, you know, any other interested parties. Uh, question nine, what is the role of the Texas Water Development Board in operating um, a permit approval um, for designated zone. And really our role is kind of, you know, uh, it's detailed in, really specifically in House Bill 722, which is really to review 
um, the permit approval um, in the application. But um, so really it's more a third party, scientific, very technical review. Um, so that would be really our role. And then finally, when multiple GCDs span a zone, will TWDB review GCD rules for consistency? And you know, the Texas Water Development Board is not required to do that by statute. Um, so we would not be um, doing some of that. In, you know, we would not be doing a, a review for that. So these are just some of the questions that we would receive that kind of going over. Um, in the future, we have more questions. You know, we will make sure to kind of you know, keep track of them and keep responses so that we could share with stakeholders and GCDs that are looking to adopt rules for House Bill 722. And, you know, I hope, you know, sharing some of these questions really kind of helps with the process while um, you guys are actually thinking about adopting rules. And I think Mary Sauls is kind of going to go into um, provide kind of an, a case example of a GCD she's working with and some of the things that have come up as they started implementing or trying to adopt rules for House Bill 722. Uh, thank you for your time and um, I'll be available later for some questions. Awesome. Thank you, ma'am. And we did have a couple that came in and have some uh, time to get to a couple of those right quick. Uh, the first one was, what was the basis for using the three miles as a common buffer from other House Bill 30 designated areas or boundaries? Um, we just, we considered um, the effects of withdrawal to the nearest receptor well. Um, so that's how we came up with the three mile buffer. Um, it, depending on the aquifer, it may, like I mentioned, it might be more than three miles, um, but that's how we considered, um, that's how we came up with the three mile buffer. Awesome. And then it, the other one we, other one we had was uh, when, when all through the process of, of designating a, uh, a desig, a brackish groundwater production zone designation, does a GCD get notification or does it can you repeat that again i apologize it you're good i say it helps when i stumble through it uh when throughout the process did gcds get notice of possible pr uh, brackish production zones being designated okay yeah we engaged the uh try to engage the stakeholders and the gcds throughout the whole implementation process so even from the initiation of an aquifer study, what we did is we send out email blast or we actually presented at either um, the GMA meeting or the regional water planning meeting that was near the aquifer in the vicinity of the area. And so we would either touch base with them. Also, when we um, in the initial process, we touch base with them to try to get data and to tell them that we are actually doing the study. And then kind of in the middle, we in the middle of the process, when we start kind of identifying and evaluating areas, we also kind of went and presented about the potential areas that could become a zone. And then finally, we also, um, when we send, we go to the board for the formal designation, we go ahead and send email blast to our stakeholder list, which includes all the GCDs um, and we would, let them know, you know, here are either final reports or here's the board memo. Uh, if you have comments, please submit them and then we would do the final designation. And we do awesome. have a whole like website uh, on brackish groundwater production zones where, you know, several of these maps are available there and even the GIS files for zones are available for people to download. Awesome. And one last question, uh, as are y'all still working on, I think you had referenced it in some of your answers to the rulemaking process that y'all are going through, um, but are y'all still working on a guidance document listing information that they want in an application uh, for y'all's review? Uh, I know that John Meyer had been working on that, uh, you know, through last year before he, he retired and just kind of a follow-up mm -hmm. on, on those efforts. Yes. Um, we do, as I mentioned early in one of the slides, we do have a list of data requirements that we think GCD should be asking permittees. And then, like I mentioned, we have shared that with a few stakeholders. We also have drafted a one-pager 
on like what a permit review would be for TW staff. It's really more internal and it's more a uh, very high level, like step-by-step -step process that staff should take to do that permit review. Similar to the investigation for an annual report review, we do have a one pager, um, but they're really draft and, you know, we really, those will get kind of updated once we start doing some of these reviews. You know, we at, at this point, we haven't done an operating permit review or a annual report review either. Um, and so they're just kind of initial draft guidance of what we should be looking for. And it, they're really um, closely tied to House Bill 722, what's required in the bill. Awesome. Well, again, really appreciate your time and uh, your presentation. Again, it'll be provided uh, later for everybody to review and see.